Good afternoon, everyone. We'll begin the webinar in about one minute. Thank you for joining us. OK, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Washington's volcanoes. We're, we're happy to have you here for as we get towards the end of Volcano Awareness Month in Washington. Um, so thank you for taking some time to learn about your volcanic hazards and what you can do about them. Uh, we're really excited to have some folks from the USGS Volcano Observatory, uh, the Cascades Volcano Observatory here, and from the city of Puyallup to talk about different aspects of volcano preparedness and the science behind all of our volcano monitoring. Um, this presentation will be recorded, so if you have friends who are going to miss it, uh, we will put it on Washington Emergency Management Division's YouTube page after the presentation. Um, it should be up in a couple of days. And uh, there is a question feature, so if you have questions, please feel free to use that on Teams. Uh, it's going to work best if you're logged in through a browser, um, but it should work on the app as well. Um, my name is Brian Turbush. I'm the Earthquake and Volcano Program Coordinator at Washington Emergency Management Division. Um, and I'm going to go last in these presentations, so um, sit back and enjoy. Um, think of those questions and please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll answer them either um, through the presentation or at the end, we'll have a short question and answer session. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Liz Westby from the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory to talk about that. <laughs> uh, thank you, Brian. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Liz Westby. And I'm a geologist and outreach specialist at the US Geological Survey. And I work at the Cascades Volcano Observatory here in Vancouver, Washington. And I want to talk to you um, today about uh, CVO turning 40. 2022 is a very special year for CVO. It's the 40th anniversary of the dedication of the David A. Johnston Cascades Volcano Observatory. And if you start going back 40 plus years, it really doesn't take much to realize how and why CDO got its start and what motivates us to monitor volcanoes. So for that, um, CVO's origin story goes back to Mount St. Helens prior to 1980. These are photos from the Spirit Lake area, which is about four miles north of the volcano, and they were all taken before the catastrophic eruption. So at the time, it's really interesting con to consider that the USGS, although it had an active research program that included work at Mount St. Helens and other volcanoes at the Cascade Range like Mount Rainier and Mount Baker, but in 1980, there was no physical observatory. It simply did not not exist. And of course that changed very dramatically in the spring of 1980. Uh, Mount St. Helens actually grabbed everyone's attention in mid-March with the sudden and dramatic increase in earthquakes. And as the number of earthquakes increased per day, it became clear that Mount St. Helens was reawakening after 123 years of quiet. 
And so thus began the, the mad scramble to, um, to staff everyone, to find the resources, everything that would be required to monitor the volcano and communicate the hazards. So USGS, they flew in from other areas. They were living in a motel. They were using office space and resources from the US Forest Service in an effort to try and figure out what was going on at the volcano and to communicate these hazards. So the seismicity was followed by the first steam and ash explosion on March 27th of 1980. And the blast opened up a crater in the summit that deepened and widened with each explosion. So USGS officials at the time issued a hazard watch to public officials. They were very concerned about rock avalanches and flooding. So local authorities evacuated an area about 15 miles around the volcano that included Spirit Lake and deputies from the Cowlitz and Skamania counties, which are the local counties here, set up roadblocks to keep people from getting too close. And over the next two months, activity at the volcano intensified and then it declined. It ramped up and then it ramped down and it was very challenging for scientists to set up monitoring networks to track all the earthquakes and the deformation that was going on on the north flank and to measure volcanic gases because they, they needed not only to collect and interpret the data but to also answer questions about the volcano and provide information about what happened in the past what could happen in the future and the types of hazards that were possible for communities that were downstream and downwind of the volcano. A particular concern was the increased deformation on the north flank of Mount St. Helens. So what was happening was a cryptodome or essentially a hidden magma body beneath the volcano's surface was producing a visible bulge. So scientists set up surveying networks on the volcano to track these surface changes, and they were finding that the area was extending at rates of anywhere from five to eight feet per day. And of course, the scientists were recognizing that there was a serious danger that this area could become unstable. You can see the bulge here in the picture in the lower right hand. You can see where all of those cracks and crevices are. That is essentially the bulge on the north flank of the volcano. And they were very concerned that if this was to fail, this avalanche of snow and rock and ice from the highest part of the volcano could rush down slope at more than 100 miles an hour possibly and wipe out everything on the north side, including Spirit Lake where this photo was taken. And of course, as we all know now, in hindsight, a landslide did occur two weeks after this newspaper from the Columbian in Vancouver, Washington, after that was published. And of course, with catastrophic consequences. So on May 18th, 1980, at 8.32 on a sunny Sunday morning, the north flank failed, essentially uncorking the volcano. Within six minutes, the lateral blast traveled 17 miles north and devastated 230 square miles of this very rugged and devastated, uh, densely forested terrain. The temperature of the blast was anywhere from 300 to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit, which was determined in part by the melted plastic in the cars and trucks found in the blast zone. And meanwhile, beneath that lateral blast, there was a landslide, sometimes referred to as the debris avalanche, that bulldozed into Spirit Lake and then turned down the North Fork of the Toodle River. In fact, slurries of mud and rock and vegetation ran down nearly all sides of the volcano. The most destructive of these, the Lahar, um, came after the after the main eruption occurred five to 15 hours later. It went down the North Fork Tootle River and it was generated as the debris avalanche deposits settled and the ice and snow within it melted. And as it flowed downstream, it destroyed homes and bridges and roads and really um, and really demonstrated how far these landslide, these hazards can travel downstream. 
Additionally, the photo that many of you are going to be familiar with is this one of Mount St. Helens. It's a column of ash rising above the volcano. This went on for nine hours. So essentially 520 million tons of ash went up into the air. The wind direction on that particular day was eastward. So communities hundreds of miles from the volcano learned very quickly what it meant to be dusted by volcanic ash. So in total of this one day, nine hour eruption, 57 people lost their lives and it resulted in more than $1 billion in losses, including loss of timber, fish, damaged roads and bridges, streets and highways needed to be cleaned up. Emergency shelters were put into place and there was temporary housing for people who were displaced for just a simple nine hour eruption. So following this, this was a very sobering event for all of the scientists who were there at the time and for the ones who came after to study the deposits. So after May 18th, they truly intensified their efforts to figure out what had happened. Did they miss warning signs? What could they have done better? The thought at the time was Mount St. Helens would certainly give us a sudden and very significant warning sign before it erupted, but truly there was none. It was that sud it was that slow and gradual bulge on the north flank and its sudden collapse that triggered the event with the devastating consequences. And because of the 57 individuals who were lost during the eruption, that truly motivated scientists to do a better job to understand volcanoes and to communicate the important safety information with people who lived along the Cascade Range. And so Mount St. Helens wasn't finished. This wasn't just a one day eruption. During the summer, it continued to erupt during the summer of 1980. There were some explosive eruptions, but then in October, it mainly settled down to a dome building eruption inside the crater. And so during this time, scientists worked to reestablish the monitoring systems and to figure out um, and understand the signals that Mount St. Helens was giving so that they could forecast short term eruptive activity. And they were actually getting pretty good at that. And it was during this time that it was decided that uh, perhaps uh, it was time to find their own space while they were using offices and relying on the U.S. Forest Service happily to do so. It was time to establish an own, their own volcano observatory. So in 1982, that's when um, the U.S. Geological Survey established and dedicated the David A. Johnston Cascades Volcano Observatory. It was dedicated to David Johnston, who lost his life during the eruption on May 18, 1980. Now, as you can see from the photos, technology that we take for granted today, like precision GPS, cell phones, laptops, just was not around in the 1980s. But scientists were incredibly innovative and creative and dedicated, and they learned a lot during that time. In fact, some of the scientists had learned a lot and were asked to respond to other international events that occurred, say down in Colombia with the Nevado del Ruiz eruption in 1985, and of course at Mount Pinatubo in 1991. So they scientists continued to advance what they learned at Mount St. Helens, applied it to other volcanoes worldwide, and then what they learned from those eruptions, they brought back to Mount St. Helens. And it didn't take very long for them to actually apply those lessons. Mount St. Helens erupted again in 2004 to 2008. There were some uh, minor steam eruptions and primarily it was a lava dome growth within the crater. But this time, CBO was ready. Monitoring technologies had advanced at that time and the scientists were ready to, um, to go into the volcano and monitor the event until it ended in 2008. So today, CBO continues to work on monitoring and understanding Mount St. Helens and all of the Cascade Range volcanoes. So this includes putting in real-time monitoring instruments like seismometers and GPS, monitoring volcanic gases, the waters that come out of, out of um, hot springs, and to take thermal measurements. So 
in addition to the real time monitoring, they're also working to understand Mount St. Helens and the eruptive history of all of our volcanoes so that we can anticipate maybe with varying degrees of certainty what might come next at each of these volcanoes. So while we can predict, we can predict the exact time and place of an eruption, we're getting better at detecting changes from unusual behavior that could precede eruptions. And from that, we'll be able to notify people about these changes. And so now um, my final slide, I'd just like to show you my colleagues here at the Cascades Volcano Observatory. You know, I believe that having this formal USGS Volcano Observatory that's focused on the Cascades has a lot of benefits. The biggest of which is we live in the communities that we serve. And so we're able to develop relationships with our monitoring partners and the emergency officials. These are people that we work closely with during times of crisis and during times of calm. So we like to communicate what's going on in volcano updates in on social media and on presentations like this one with the emergency management division to commemorate volcano awareness month we want everyone to know about volcanoes about volcano hazards and to be prepared for the next big event in the cascades and so for that i would like to end this slideshow and i'm going to turn it on uh, turn this over to uh, my colleague and the scientist in charge of the cascades volcano observatory john major Okay, great. Thank you, Liz. And let me share my presentation. <clears throat> and hopefully this is showing for everybody now. Maybe somebody can just give me a thumbs up. Um, so what I thought I'd speak to you today about is just give you a, a brief uh, sort of state of the cascades and let you know what's what's happening here in, in our in our cascades. Um, oops, let me there we go. So the Cascade Range is home to many volcanoes and volcanic fields. Um, these are very charismatic landforms, but they are geologically active. Uh, this is just a cartoon that depicts uh, eruptive frequency at various volcanoes in the Cascades over the past 4,000 years. And so you can see that different volcanoes have been uh, more or less active than others. Uh, you'll notice that Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier have been uh, particularly active in the Cascades, uh, Glacier Peak, uh, somewhat active. Um, but when you average over, say, the last 10 to 12,000 years, we typically get about two eruptions per century in the Cascades, which over a single human lifetime may not sound like a lot. But when you start thinking about generational time frames, uh, maybe you won't see one in your lifetime, but perhaps your grandchild will see it the next eruption in the Cascades. And for the emergency planners and the land use planners who have to think about long term time frames, generational time frames when they're making various sorts of land use decisions and plans, these are frequencies that uh, they do have to, to think about and, and take into consideration. Uh, just to give you a very brief uh, synopsis of the types of processes at volcanoes and what are, what are the things we worry about in the Cascades. Uh, Liz touched upon some of these uh, because at Mount St. Helens in 1980, um, we saw a cascade of all these different processes. So within what we call the near source by the volcanoes, and we're typically talking maybe within about 15 miles uh, circumference of the volcanoes, this is the area that's subject to a whole multi multitude of hazards. Uh, Liz talked about the debris avalanche, the big landslide at Mount St. Helens. Uh, we have what we call pyroclastic flows, which are these hot, uh, gaseous pumice flows. They're sort of think like the hot stone winds that, that can come off volcanoes. Um, the, the volcanic ash fall that's the coarsest material typically falls out fairly close to the volcano and the finer material drifts downwind. But close to the volcano, these are subject to um, a whole myriad of processes. But as we get further and further away from the volcanoes, um, the number of processes that can affect communities and cause havoc uh, decreases, but can be nonetheless uh, quite significant. And in the Cascades, most of our volcanoes are fairly remote. A lot of them are located in wilderness areas. They're located in national parks or national monuments. Uh, they're located in fair, relatively remote areas of our national forests. So we don't have a lot of communities really, really close to the volcanoes. So um, we don't have a lot of exposure of community to, to processes that would affect the areas close to volcanoes. But 
some of the processes, for example, these large volcanic mud flows or lahars that can travel many, many tens of miles down valley. Um, these are the types of processes that can cause uh, challenges to our communities far down valley. And, and here in the Cascades, uh, you know, our bigger population centers tend to be west of the Cascades. And these large volcanic mud flows, lahars, are what we worry about uh, for those communities. Uh, for the communities that are east of the Cascades, that's the, that's the area that's downwind of our volcanoes. And so these large volcanic uh, ash plumes that go up in the air, the wind carries that ash downwind. And so east of the Cascades, the communities that are downwind are going to be affected more by the volcanic ash fall than anything else. Um, and then what we've learned over the past 42 years since the eruption of Mount St. Helens is that we can get all this uh, reworking of the volcanic sediment on the landscape. And that reworking can cause lots of sedimentation problems uh, downstream along our river channels. And those problems can last for years to decades. At Mount St. Helens, we're 42 years after its 1980 eruption, and we're still dealing with the flush of sediment that's coming from an eruption that took place um, on a single morning, uh, largely over a span of, of several minutes. So our core functions at CVO, uh, we, you can think of a three-legged stool. One is the research. We study the histories of volcanoes. We study the processes, uh, these volcanic processes that we briefly mentioned. We try to develop predictive models. In particular, we have uh, been really focusing a lot of effort on predictive models for these large volcanic mud flows, these lahars, and for volcanic ash fall, where it goes and how much ash will be deposited depending on uh, the current, the, the wind directions at the time. And we do our hazard assessments. So each of our volcanoes has, has uh, undergone at least one hazard assessment. We're in the process now of revising many of those. Um, another one of our uh, functions is monitoring, and we'll touch upon that. Liz touched upon that a little bit, and I'll get back to that here shortly. And then our community preparedness, where we work with various stakeholders, emergency, room man emergency management uh, personnel, land use uh, managers, et cetera. We provide a lot of educational materials and we do uh, activities like this. So this is part of our public outreach. Um, but let me just focus on volcano monitoring. Uh, Liz touched on this a little bit and we sort of have three workhorses in our monitoring network. One are the seismometers because as magma works its way toward the surface, it has to break the rock. And as it breaks the rock and breaks a pathway toward the surface, it generates earthquakes. So we watch for not only the the sizes of the earthquakes, we look at the style of earthquakes, we look at the frequency earthquakes, and we look at whether those earthquakes, whether they're changing depth with as a function of time. So as magma gets closer, closer to the surface, we would expect the earthquakes getting closer to the surface as well. So we look at how the how the depth of the earthquakes changes with time. Another one of the workhorses is uh, monitoring volcanic gases because as magma gets closer to the surface, the gases that are within the magma get released. And in particular, we watch for carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. And then our third workhorse is what we call ground deformation. And we monitor that through GPS technology and satellite technologies. And think of it a balloon that's inflating. Um, as, as the magma gets closer to the ground surface, that ground is going to lift up a little bit. And we can detect very subtle changes uh, and in particular, if those subtle ground uh, deformation is associated with earthquakes and, and increasing amounts of volcanic gases, that tells us something about uh, magma moving closer to the surface. So these are the kinds of things we watch for with our monitoring network. So let's, let's take a little tour of the Cascades. We'll go up to Mount Baker. Um, there's nothing unusual going on at Mount Baker. There's no unusual activity. Uh, sometimes if the atmospheric conditions are just right, people in Bellingham, uh, a little further south, will actually see steam, typically from the Sherman Crater area. That's very common and often uh, it gets misinterpreted as, as Mount Baker might be erupting. And we'll get, uh, we'll get phone calls here at the Cascades Volcano Observatory telling us something's going on at Mount Baker. But, uh, you know, Mount Baker is one of the volcanoes where we're, re we're, we're doing new lahar hazard assessments using some of these new tools, these new predictive tools that I mentioned. But we do consider Mount Baker to be one of our uh, inadequately monitored volcanoes. There's not a lot of monitoring, and so we are making plans to expand our monitoring footprint out there eventually. 
And in 2021, we identified several sites uh, that might make useful sites for us to expand our monitoring. And we're presently preparing a permit application. Uh, Mount Ver part of Mount Baker's in the wilderness, and so we have to go through a fairly rigorous permitting process. At Glacier Peak, uh, again, no unusual activity is happening at Glacier Peak. Um, again, Glacier Peak is another one of the volcanoes we consider to be inadequately monitored. Right now, there's only one seismometer that's actually operated by the University of Washington Pacific Northwest the Seismic Network. Um, so that's the only uh, monitoring equipment that's out there right now. Um, the U.S. Forest Service recently completed the, the permit review process and has uh, granted us permission to install four new sites around uh, Glacier Peak in the wilderness area. And we will probably begin to work on those installs uh, next summer. At Mount Rainier, uh, Mount Rainier is one of our volcanoes that likes to talk to us a lot. So we have uh, earthquakes up there quite a bit. Uh, they're a very common occurrence. They're usually very small, less than about magnitude 2, 2.5. They're generally very shallow. Some of what we uh, actually measure are ice earth, earthquakes generated by ice, ice quakes. Uh, one of the things in the past year, uh, we've done a, a new look at some of the lahars that could be generated at Mount Rainier, particularly on the west side in the Puyallup and Nisqually Valleys. And we've uh, released a brand new report that looks at simulations of hypothetical lahars that potentially could travel down these valleys. Um, that work supplements our existing hazard assessment. It doesn't uh, replace anything, doesn't provide uh, doesn't change our hazard assessment, I guess I should say. Um, the, the basics of our prior hazard assessment are still intact and still accurate, but this just provides finer scale details of lahars in a couple of valleys, and this is the kind of information that's very useful to the emergency management planners. And we actually have a complimentary YouTube video uh, that Liz produced that you can find at this link that uh, provides a little more public digestion of, of the, the contents of this report. Excuse me, and just to give you a sense of of what this report does, uh, this is a simulation of a hypothetical ahar that goes down the Puyall or yeah, the Puyallup River Valley. Um, so I'll let this cycle through just a couple of times very briefly, so you can see the uh, the counter there in the lower right. Uh, excuse me, the lower left uh, part of that simulation is in hours and minutes. So you can see in this case, this hypothetical ahar would actually reach Sumner and Puyallup in about three and a half to four hours. We'll let it cycle through here again. So we'll, we have this uh, a large landslide off the western face of Mount Rainier, generates this lahar. In this case, it reaches Ording in about an hour and continues on down the valley, gets down to Sumner and Puyallup in about uh, three and a half to four hours. <clears throat> so this is the kind of information that's very useful to the emergency management planners. And so this is just providing a little bit finer scale uh, detail on, on potential hypothetical events that might happen in the future. Uh, but we're not making any predictions that this will happen or when something like this happens. Uh, but in order to allow us the earliest possible detection of this kind of an event, we're working on building out a Lahar detection system on the west side of Mount Rainier. <coughs> we have some we have some significant field campaigns planned in the coming months to install additional sites both within and outside the park national park uh, these will include additional seismic and what we call infrasound systems and this will provide us more precise information uh, about the location the timing and the relative vigor of an event should it occur on the western side of, of mount rainier and this will lead to improved early warnings that we can then uh, get get that word out to the, the emergency managers who can then get the word out to the public should an event like this take place. Um, at Mount Adams, there's no unusual activity going on, um, but at Mount Adams, lahars are a concern for us. Uh, lahars have occurred in the past there. Uh, Mount Adams, again, another one of the volcanoes we don't consider to be very adequately monitored. And so we're planning on installing some new sites at Mount, at Mount Adams. Um, we're targeting an install of about five more sites, and these will likely take place in the 2023 to 2024 timeframe. And again, will provide us the ability to provide the earliest possible warning should there be lahars that happen at Mount Adams. Uh, Mount St. Helens, uh, mostly what we do at Mount St. Helens these days is uh, station maintenance and upgrades uh, on the monitoring side. 
Uh, we're working with the Forest Service and the Corps of Engineers to uh, establish a new temporary lake level station at Spirit Lake because some of you may be aware that uh, the, the Forest Service and the Corps of Engineers are planning to do some upgrades to the, uh, the, the uh, entrance gate to the tunnel that drains Spirit Lake. And our current uh, monitoring system is right near that uh, entrance gate. And so we have to actually move it so they can do the repairs that they want to do and the upgrades. So we're working with the, the Forest Service and the Corps to, to establish a new temporary lake level station. Um, we are in the process of doing a, an assessment for what potentially could happen if Spirit Lake was to breach. Uh, for some reason, if the tunnel couldn't pass water and the lake was actually to breach the blockage, what's the downstream consequence? And so we, we've got some uh, some of that kind of work, similar to like the Lahar work at Mount Rainier, looking at the new theoretical modeling to assess what potentially could happen should Spirit Lake uh, break out of its basin. At Mount Hood, uh, some of you may be aware that last summer we had a bit of an earthquake swarm in June of 2021. Uh, the largest earthquake was a magnitude 3.9, and we actually uh, issued an information statement to, to keep the public informed as to what was going on. Um, this was located uh, a couple miles south of the summit and a few miles below uh, sea level. But this is the kind of these are the kinds of earthquakes that have happened before at Mount Hood. Um, our network showed that there was no associated ground deformation, so this wasn't indicative of magma pushing its way up to the surface, and this was likely related to movements of fluids along existing faults. In the Three Sisters, uh, last summer, last fall and winter, I guess fall of 2021, early winter 2022, we had a few uh, minor earthquake swarms. And interestingly, uh, we were able to also detect a slight uptick in some ground deformation that has been occurring to the west of the South Sister since the late 1990s. Um, what we detected was that there was a slight uptick. And so over the span of about a year, uh, a distance sort of the size of your thumb uh, uplifted over an area that's about 12 miles in diameter. Uh, we think this is related to Magma movement at about seven kilometers below the surface, or maybe about four miles below ground surface. We issued an information statement on this. And just to give you a sense of what's going on, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but this, this top plot on the left just shows you the long-term uplift that's been going on in that area. And here in the last, uh, last year or so, we had a slight uptick in that rate. There was a, a little bit of minor seismicity associated with it. So we're keeping an eye on this. We, we don't know if this is uh, just typical background activity or this is something really unusual at the Three Sisters, uh, but we're keeping a very close eye on it. And if uh, conditions change, uh, we will certainly uh, be putting out more information statements about this activity. But again, this has been going on since the late 1990s, this uplift. So this uplift is not new. Um, the rate just picked up a little bit, but, but nothing, uh, nothing that's really significant. At Newberry Volcano, uh, this past March and April, we had a little bit of an earthquake swarm. We pushed out an information statement on that. Uh, these are very shallow earthquakes. The largest was less than a magnitude two. I think it was about a 1.7. Um, and this was the largest swarm of earthquakes to occur since we actually installed a pretty new and robust uh, monitoring network in, in 2012. But again, that monitoring network showed no uh, associated ground deformation with these earthquakes. So this isn't indicative of any magma that's, that's pushing closer to the surface. Mount uh, Newberry is also a, an area where they're doing um, geothermal uh, inspections, geothermal prospecting. So we know magma is at relatively shallow depths here, uh, but right now there's no indication that it's trying to push its way up to the surface. And with the lower, uh, with the droughts we've been having and the low levels of the lakes at uh, Newberry Volcano, um, we've been having reports of additional gas emissions around the shores of the lake. And so we've we've uh, had people out there monitoring the gases. And right now the gas emissions are pretty low, nothing's changing, but we keep an eye on this. And then at Crater Lake, there's no unusual activity. Uh, we're just doing routine maintenance and keeping our monitoring sites functional there. And we've got ongoing research into the regional faulting around the volcano and the volcanic system. So in summary, we have a pretty good handle on the hazards at each of the volcanoes in the Cascades. Uh, fortunately, most of our volcanoes are remote, don't pose an immediate threat to large populations. But some of the processes that we talked about, in particular, these large volcanic mud flows and the volcanic ash flow, or volcanic ash falls that go far downwind can expose large populations to, to a couple of hazards. 
So we continue to vigilantly monitor our volcanoes. Uh, we're expanding our monitoring footprint uh, at some to bring them up to a, uh, a level that's commensurate with the, the threats that they'll pose to society and to give us the, the best possible opportunity to, at any uh, early detection of anything that's unusual. We're enhancing our modeling capabilities, particularly with regard to volcanic lahars and volcanic ash falls. And we're gaining better knowledge about the nuances of the volcanic histories and behaviors of our volcanoes. So where can you get additional information? I list here um, our volcano notification service, which you can sign up for uh, whenever we issue any sort of alerts or notices uh, it goes out via that system. We do our weekly updates to tell you what's been happening in the prior week. Uh, you can visit our Cascades Volcano Observatory website, and you can also follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram the USGS Volcanoes, and that'll provide uh, lots of information. So these are the main ways we communicate our information out to the public. And with that, my presentation is done, so I'm going to hand off to Kirsten Hoffman from the city of Puyallup. Unshare my screen. Hey, Kirsten, all yours. Thank you so much, John. And thank you so much, Liz, for your presentations and for sharing uh, such great information. Kirsten, with just all a of second. Us. Um, you're oh. not sharing at the moment. Um, can you please try to share your slides again? Yes. Do you see those now, Brian? You're good. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for letting me know, Brian, that they weren't being shared. My name is Kirsten Hoffman. I'm the emergency manager for the city of Puyallup. Uh, thank you so much, John and Liz, for your presentations and sharing your information. Uh, every time we get a chance to hear from our uh, expert colleagues at the USGS, there's new things that we pick up and learn and that we can integrate into our emergency management preparedness and planning efforts. So I'm really excited today to be with you all to talk about a just recently conducted regional Lahar evacuation exercise. This was conducted on April 29th, 2022, just last month. And this was the largest volcanic exercise of its type to be conducted in North America. And this was the first time that we had seven jurisdictions coming together to support five school districts. And I'm going to share a summary of how the exercise went, some of our learnings and some of our next steps. Uh, I'll also share my contact information at the end, because if you have any questions about the exercise or the planning process we undertook, um, I'd love to help answer those questions or put you in contact with people who can provide additional information and assistance. So the exercise was, was conducted by uh, EPIC, which is an acronym for the East Pierce Interlocal Coalition for Emergency Management. We refer to that as EPIC, and there are seven jurisdictions that are part of this coalition, including the city of Puyallup, the city of Bonnie Lake, city of Sumner, city of Ording, city of Buckley, and the town of Wilkeson and Carbonado. And these jurisdictions came together just about a year and a half ago to form a coalition to support their emergency management preparedness, planning, training, and exercise efforts. We face a lot of the similar hazards and threats in the east part of Pierce County, and we recognize that if we combined our resources and our efforts to jointly work on emergency management preparedness, planning, training, and exercise, that that would be uh, a big benefit to our region and the residents that we serve. The EPIC Coalition has a multi-year work plan that prioritizes our efforts. And one of the uh, projects that we just recently completed was the East Pierce County Lahar Rapid Action Plan, the RAP. And I'll talk about that more in a couple other minutes. Uh, coalitions also worked on the region's continuity of operations plans and will begin working on a regional comprehensive emergency management plan in the next couple of months. Uh, the coalition conducts a number of trainings and exercises throughout the year. Uh, in the last year, not only did we conduct the full-scale Lahar evacuation exercise, we also conducted a full-scale shelter exercise back in October. Uh, one of the other projects we're working on is the implementation of an alert and warning system for each of the jurisdictions in the coalition. And for any of you who live, work, uh, go to school, or conduct business in any of those seven jurisdictions, we encourage you to go to those jurisdictions websites and sign up for those alert systems so that you can get information uh, via cell phone, text, um, and email about emergency situations in those jurisdictions. And then finally, we collaborate on training and exercise opportunities for our region. The coalition has an emergency management portal 
This is the front page of that website. If you go to Epic EOC, e -P -I -C -E -O -C .com, you'll have access to this portal and there's very robust information in the portal about preparedness efforts, the different threats and hazards that we face in the east part of the county. You can click on the links to sign up for alert and warning um, systems in each of the jurisdictions. And we also have an interactive dashboard. It's a GIS tool uh, that uh, is continuously updated and used not only in preparedness, but then also in response. It's a way for all of us to very quickly share our response efforts throughout the region uh, with each other, with the public via this portal. So we spend a lot of time talking about Mount Rainier in the uh, in the EPIC coalition. Um, this is a beautiful picture of part of the community that we serve. Uh, we talk a lot about no notice and or short notice lahars. Um, not only do uh, we work on plans and conduct training and exercises for volcanic response, but we also provide a lot of public education and information about Mount Rainier and the different threats um, that we face uh, living closely to it. Uh, and so we work a lot with our res residents, businesses and communities on education about Mount Rainier. One of the plans that the coalition just recently completed is the East Pierce County Lahar Rapid Action Plan. And this is a plan designed for first responders, police personnel, uh, fire personnel, emergency management personnel, public works personnel, any first responder in the Lahar hazard zone um, in the event of a, a short notice or, or no notice Lahar, this plan identifies the immediate action steps for them to take. And we prioritized the first 24 to 48 hours post Lahar uh, in this plan so that our first responders had a good understanding of what they're supposed to do in the event of a Lahar and that we as a region can very, very quickly uh, begin to support people evacuating the area and request the resources from outside the area that we know we're going to need um, very quickly and then for some time post Lahar. This plan is designed for first responders. It includes a critical action guide. Uh, we know that a lot of our first responders don't have time to read a lengthy emergency response plan. So it was our goal to come up with a critical action guide that's just a couple of pages long with their critical steps they're supposed to take. And it was developed by multi-jurisdictional, seven jurisdictions, multi-discipline law enforcement, uh, fire personnel, emergency management, who came together to work on this plan. And components of this plan, in addition um, to working with school districts to conduct the regional Lahar evacuation exercise, we also tested components of the rapid action plan. So the regional Lahar evacuation exercise had four overarching objectives for the exercise. The number one objective was providing for the safety and accountability of all the participants, students, staff, and responders throughout the East Pierce regional Lahar evacuation exercise. So what this meant was that the students who evacuated on foot did modified versions of their evacuation route. Uh, many of the schools who practiced their, their walkout routes did not do the full routes um, because we wanted them to get familiar with the routes they were supposed to take, uh, practice leaving their school buildings quickly upon notification of an incoming lahar, uh, and then get to evacuation locations, go through accountability, and then head back to their schools after the exercise. And because safety was the most important priority, there's certain things that we do to ensure that safety during the exercise that we know we're not going to be able to do during the event of an actual lahar. So in, so in addition to getting um, all of the participants ready for the exercise, also talking about other emergency preparedness uh, efforts and opportunities for them to practice what they would do in the event of other emergencies as well. Uh, we also wanted to maintain traffic control and safe travels for all the students and staff participating. We utilized one of our uh, GIS dashboard resources that we use in the Coalition for Preparedness and Response. It was um, specifically designed to support all of the participating schools in the evacuation exercise. And I'll show everybody um, a little uh, overview of that tool in a bit. And then finally, familiarize the students with their evacuation routes and provide them with the tools and the information to be prepared for a real life Lahar evacuation. So really want to ensure that students are aware, students and staff in our communities are aware of what their actions are in the event of an incoming Lahar and what they can expect um, from the first responder community, the jurisdictions surrounding them and how we're all gonna co collaborate as part of the response. So the jurisdictions that participated 
in the planning of this exercise and the coordination are Puyallup, Sumner, Ording, Bonnie Lake, Buckley, Carbonado, and Wilkeson. The school districts included the Puyallup School District, the Sumner Bonnie Lake School District, Ording School District, White River School District, and the Carbonado Historical School District. And for the exercise, three emergency operations centers were activated, the Puyallup Emergency Operations Center, the Bonnie Lake Emergency Operation, and the Buckley Emergency Operations Center. And it, the planning process for an exercise of this magnitude takes about a year. So just about a year ago, we pulled all of the different participating school di districts together along with the uh, corresponding jurisdictions to support them. And we conducted a tabletop exercise, which is a low stress exercise uh, to begin talking about what a response would look like in this type of a situation. And then from that tabletop exercise a year ago, we built up to the full scale that was just conducted. So over 40 schools, throughout the region participated with just over 14,000 students and staff practicing their walking routes and just over 11,000 students and staff who practice their shelter in place procedures. And those are the procedures that schools out of the immediate impact zone uh, would, uh, would do in the event of uh, an incoming Lahar. And between the three emergency operations centers that were activated, there were over 120 EOC staff that we're supporting and well over 100 first responders and jurisdiction staff who helped day of the exercise as well. So this is the slide of the GIS dashboard. If you look down in the right corner of the screen, you'll see that the clock is progressing and this is sped up so that we can see uh, quickly in this presentation format the progress the schools were making. But this is a tool that we updated and used at the three emergency operations centers to track the progress of the schools evacuating those that were sheltering in place, those who completed the exercise, uh, had conducted their accountability, and then were heading back to school. And this was updated by personnel in the emergency operations centers via radio and cell phone to the schools and the contacts in the field at the schools who were sharing the updated information with us real time. So we were able to see the status of all of the participating schools. And it was really, really helpful to be able to get um, this large uh, image of the status of the uh, schools as they as they went through the exercise. And then it was a sigh of relief when 100% of all of the participating um, schools had completed the exercise. Couple of photos from the exercise. Uh, these are some pictures from the Puyallup Emergency Operations Center. We have staff from multiple jurisdictions, multiple school districts, multiple first responders, well over 80 people on the Puyallup Emergency Operations Centers that day to, uh, to help facilitate and support the exercise. This is a photo from the Buckley Emergency Operations Center. You'll see city staff, fire personnel, law enforcement personnel, school district personnel, um, again, supporting the schools in the White River School District and the Carbonado Historical School District. And this is the Bonnie Lake Emergency Operations Center. Again, you'll see city staff, uh, first responder staff, including fire and law enforcement personnel, school district staff, supporting the uh, schools in the Bonnie Lake Sumner School District. These are some pictures from the day of uh, watching the students and schools practice their evacuation. And you'll see that each school had uh, their own plan and their own process for conducting their evacuation, you'll see some signs that people are holding that say Lahar drill in progress. You'll also see some signs that have names and numbers on them. Those were to keep track of students as they evacu evacuated uh, classroom by, by classroom so they could continue to uh, maintain accountability throughout the exercise. And this is another picture of some of the students evacuating. Um, on the right there, you'll see um, some students uh, practicing their evacuation. And one of the uh, priorities of this exercise and the planning was ensuring that every single student and every single staff had the opportunity to practice their Lahar evacuation route. So any uh, access and functional needs planning or work that needed to be done to prepare to help everybody have a chance to participate uh, was part of the planning process. So I'm going to share a video that the Sumner Bonnie Lake School District uh, released after the exercise, and I can't think of a better way um, to share the impact and the success of the exercise than by watching and listening to students and staff who participated.
the city of Sumner, in partnership with the Sumner Bonnie Lake School District, conducted its first ever full scale regional test of our Lahar evacuation plan. We participated um, in the drill by walking to the YMCA, which is just the first stop before we head up to Corliss in the real event. The Lahar drill, it helped us prepare for if there was an actual Lahar. And it makes sure that we're all safe and we know what to do. I learned that we are absolutely prepared for the real thing. Our staff and students have done a marvelous job of you know, being educated on what is the Lahar. Why would we need to do this? The Lahar is a big hot mud flow that happens when a volcano such as Mount Rainier, which I'm also pretty sure is right over there. If it exploded, all the melted snow would go into the rivers and it would get a lot of debris and it would like slush everywhere <laughs> around here. The school, the students and the staff and the teachers did an amazing job uh, having an orderly, safe evacuation route. They followed every expectation that we've prepared for. They walked with their class. They um, knew the routes ahead of time. I think it went really good. Like everybody was in line, in line. They weren't talking too loud. It's all in the preparation and the educating our students on what to do and why, the, why it's important. As a parent myself who has children who go to school in the Valley, it is extremely important for our parents to know that we take safety very seriously. We plan and prepare for every drill. An exercise of this scale and magnitude requires a lot of people and a lot of hands and a lot of work. Our students are prepared and it's because we put in the work to make sure they understand the importance of it. Our teachers are on board and our families should know that they are in great hands when it comes to safety. If you visit the epiceoc.com website, you can look at the volcanic section of emergency response dashboard, and you'll see the recently revised and coordinated regional Lahar evacuation routes. And these are the routes that we encourage our public to become familiar with. Uh, and we have multiple uh, uh, evacuation locations identified for the public, as well as vehicular and pedestrian routes. So we really encourage everyone to uh, check this out and begin to be get familiar with their appropriate Lahar evacuation routes. And again, that website is epiceoc.com. And I know we're gonna take questions at the end, but here's my phone number and my email address. If you have any questions about the exercise or the planning or any of the partners, let me know. It's my absolute pleasure to be able to share that exercise with all of you uh, and the work of a really fantastic team that made it possible. So with that, I will turn it over to Brian Turbush with the state. Thank you, Kirsten. Let me get my slides up here. Thank you all for attending so far today. Um, hope you've been learning from the experts a little bit. I'm really happy to have them all here to help out um, because this very much is a, a group effort. Um, so, so far you've heard from the scientists who watch the volcanoes and you've heard from a community that helps prepare for them. Um, so I'm gonna bring it back down to kind of the individual level, um, what you can do about your volcano hazards. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful. The next volcanic eruption, even though we're not really sure exactly when that will be, um, as was mentioned. So one thing I want you to take away from this, if you live in Washington, um, the next eruption will likely impact you in some way. Um, we've seen examples that Liz shared about different sizes of eruptions that have happened just at Mount St. Helens. Um, but we can also go back to 1975 and see Mount Baker had some um, a lot of extra heat flow. And because of that, they prepared as if it was going to erupt. They closed campgrounds. They lowered the water in dams. Um, this was a very small um, set uh, pre-eruption that didn't actually end up erupting, um, but it did have a lot of impacts on the area, uh, impacts on the rec recreation and the economy in the area. Um, 
And again, we saw 2004 to 2008 when St. Helens started erupting again. Um, it wasn't nearly as big of an impact, but got a huge amount of media attention and areas were definitely closed um, because we know how destructive these could be. Um, what I'd like to focus on is just that there is a lot of uncertainty associated with these volcanic eruptions. Um, on the far side, we have like what happened back in May 1980 and beyond. Um, we can have extreme impacts of this. Um, 27 bridges destroyed, um, hundreds of buildings, and um, as John mentioned, we're, we are still facing the impacts of this 1980 eruption as far as sedimentation. Um, so these will likely impact you in some way, although I would like you to make sure everybody understands how to get a realistic expectation of their hazards from their particular volcano. Um, so something to address here quickly, um, stealing this one from the USGS, this uh, graphic, but uh, we have a different amount of warning and uh, duration of the event for all these different hazards we might experience in Washington. Um, so uh, typically things like floods and hurricanes, we might get a few days of warning, those weather forecasts. Um, and, but when it moves into earthquakes and tsunamis, wildfires, we don't get any warning. Those can't be predicted. Um, they just start and then the impacts go on. Now when we get to volcanic eruptions, I'm going to talk about unrest a lot here and what you could do during that. Um, unrest is just kind of that period where the volcano is doing something and they're detecting it, that magma movement, but you're not really sure if it's going to lead to an eruption or how quickly, because that could last weeks to months. It could last years or it could just last a couple days. Um, so during that time, there's going to be a lot of speculation, a lot of forecasting, trying to figure out what's going on, um, but no real definite predictions because it could just go back to sleep like Mount Baker did in 1975. Um, and then there's also this other period of eruption and uncertainty. Once that starts erupting, how long will it last? Because um, there was that eruption in 1980. Um, it continued through the summer. There were a lot more eruptions after that. It, it can continue for days, weeks, months, years potentially. Um, so a lot of uncertainty in there, um, but like we said, they're they're watching pretty closely. Um, so how will you know about this? Because that's one of the most important parts. Um, USGS, that volcano notification service that uh, John mentioned signing up for, and we highly encourage um, just so you know what's going on at your volcano and the others around you. Um, all our volcanoes are normal right now. They are all doing what they normally do. Again, they all have, they speak to us in different ways. Mount Rainier has a lot, um, a lot of earthquakes. It's also very highly monitored, so it's easier to listen to, um, whereas we don't hear as much from Mount Baker or Mount Adams. Um, if something's going on, it might move up to an advisory status or possibly a watch. Uh, and all of these can move up and down depending on what the volcano is doing. Um, but typically, because our volcanoes are well monitored, they're typically going to move through these stages before they do something, especially because they haven't erupted in a while. So they got to break a lot of rock in order for something to happen. St. Helens could go pretty quickly in, in one case because it has erupted so quick uh, recently. But um, still, you're probably going to get these stages as, uh, as, as things start to change within the volcanic edifice. Um, most important, know how you're going to get those alerts. Um, Okay, so I'm going to break this down really easily for you. Uh, preparedness for any hazard. We're talking volcanoes, but those are the ones we had on the sheet. Um, wildfires, we have earthquakes, we have tsunamis in Washington. Um, you master these steps for those, you're going to be much more prepared for anything that comes up. Um, first off, learn your hazards and how you're going to be alerted. Really important, if you don't get that message, what are you going to do about it? Um, to make your plans. Um, once you know what your hazards are, um, figure out a way to plan how you're going to communicate, where you're going to go, what you're going to do about it, and then build kits. Um, Got to have some stuff, so I'm going to go into each of those in a little more detail. So learning your hazards, um, realistic expectation of your hazards. Um, if you live in Seattle, Mount Rainier might not actually impact you very much directly. However, there are some things that it could do that will cause some impact. So um, know what to expect. Joining this webinar, really good step for starting to understand what your hazards are. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these hazard maps that are created by the USGS. Each of our volcanoes has these, and you can go to the Cascades Volcano Observatory webpage to look up your local volcano, um, understand what the impacts are. So each of them, we have this. Uh, so let's see, look at the, um, how, how are you going to protect yourself from each of these types of events? So breaking these down, 
um, we have the near volcano hazards in the this kind of pink area around there. That's the really big ones. These pyroclastic flows, these clouds of gas and ash that your lava flows. Um, the really, really big heavy ash fall. Um, so near volcano hazards. Um, that's this pink area. Um, Lahar hazards are these warm colors that can travel tens of miles down the, the river valleys. Um, saw the kids talking about them in the video, but um, really the only thing you can do if these are coming is to get out of the way. Um, and we have this bridge here for scale. Um, so near, Lahar, and then volcanic ash, the other one, depends which way the wind is blowing, wherever you are. Um, and I'm not going to sing it, but please feel free to sing along near, Lahar, wherever you are. Um, but I like that way to remember how to tell the difference between the parts on your hazard map. Um, but go take a look at those for your volcano. Um, and here's another tool that can really help you out with learning about those. Um, this is from our Washington Geological Survey, or from part of Department of Natural Resources. They have a geology portal. Um, and what I like about this is it has the same maps um, that USGS uses but you can look up your volcano and you can actually type an address. A really good things to do here, type in your home address, see if you're within these areas, um, type in your workplace, type in your children's schools if they go there. Um, type in areas along your commute so you can understand if those will be in the hazard because this is all part of understanding what you might be exposed to uh, and how you're going to react if you get that hazard notification in any of those locations. Um, maybe more places, maybe you frequently visit somewhere. Um, just understand what the hazards are going to be where you are. Um, and this tool is really useful for volcanic hazards because um, you can actually zoom in on those areas and see what there is, but you can also look up your tsunami routes. Um, uh, or your tsunami hazards, or um, if you're in an area that's um, under landslide threat, or what the shaking might be from an earthquake. So we're really happy this tool is available. Um, and then the other part of this, know how you're going to get alerted. Now our mil.wa.gov slash alerts page, we tried to compile all of this together in one place. Um, we have a link to the volcano notification service so you can sign up. Again, highly recommend that. Um, but another part of that is, um, as Kirsten was mentioning, your, your local alerts are going to be really important there. Um, because they're going to impact a local hazard, maybe something like code red. Um, we'll also have links to information about NOAA weather radios, which can also share volcanic information. Um, so yeah, know where you're going to receive this reliable information and updates. Um, USGS is the source for volcano info, um, and your locals are going to tell you when you need to evacuate and things like that. Um, if you have the siren system in your area, you can learn more about that from your local emergency management as well. Okay. Moving on to the next step here. We've talked about learning your hazards and getting alerted. Um, make plans. And you got to think about those places where you live, work, commute, where your kids go to school. Um, if you live in a valley that's at a threat of a lahar, you need to know how to evacuate and you need to know what you're going to do. Um, highly recommended is walk out. It sounds like a lot, but last, last month we saw that 14 1,500 students and teachers were all able to walk out of Pewell up in these other districts uh, within the time that was established by the model. So you can do this, um, but practice those evacuation routes from your home as well. Um, knowing how to do it from the school is one way, but maybe it's a different route from home. Um, so understand those, um, but also know where you're going to meet people. Um, perhaps someone's at school and someone's at home or work. Um, where are you going to meet together? How are you going to communicate? Say who you're going to call, but please text, don't call because emergency responders will want that line open um, as much bandwidth for 911 as possible. Um, and write down those numbers. Sometimes when you're stressed, your memory doesn't work quite as well. Um, have some tools for that at mil.wa.gov slash preparedness. You can write down the names and addresses of contacts, but also um, write down what your plans are exactly where you're going to go because um, those will be really helpful to have in an emergency. Um, can step into build kits finally. Have those materials ready for when you need them because um, you're going to want to have them on hand. I like to say what preparedness is, what preparedness isn't. Um, preparedness is just adding one item every time you go to the grocery store, maybe one non perishable thing, um, a can of soup or something that you can easily eat or have an emergency. It is not stockpiling toilet paper. Uh, that is, that's not preparedness, that's hoarding. Um, but if you just get a bigger one every time you go, you will have what you need. Um, you just stock up ahead of time. 
So what we're talking about here for building kits, and yes, that's plural, um, a grab and go kit is really important for Lahar evacuation. You want to have some materials, um, some water, some food, um, maybe your phone charger, a way that you're going to be able to call. Um, think about if you suddenly had to evacuate and you wouldn't be able to get back to your home um, that night. So other, you need to think about what you will need. Uh, maybe you have medications. Maybe you need reading glasses or eyeglasses. Um, and in the case that your house might not be there when you get back, because that is a possibility with Lahars, unfortunately. Um, that's why it's so important to get out of the way. Um, think about any important documents. Can you take photos of them? Can you have um, have those stored on a protected USB drive? So just think about your items. This is different than getting two weeks ready, the two weeks of supplies. That's more in case of an earthquake, but if you live in Western Washington, you might have to worry about both. So tips on both of those, mill.wa.gov slash preparedness. Um, food and water, important, but think about if you're bringing your pets too. Don't forget them. Okay, now you might be scared by this idea of two weeks ready or preparedness kits. Um, the point is everybody is somewhere when it comes to preparedness. Even if you just look at your pantry, you might have some non-perishable food, and I'm here to tell you that is better than nothing. And you are also here and you're learning about your volcano hazards, so you are getting more prepared as you talk. Don't worry, you are. it is not hopeless. So um, yeah, everybody starts somewhere and it's a continuum because you're always going to have to refresh and restock because unfortunately none of that food really lasts forever. Um, but um, we have a program called Prepare in a Year that is designed to make this as easy as possible for you. Activities are about one hour per month, um, so please feel free to look that up on our web page. I'm going to try to move through this quickly, but um, ultimately before we get to questions, what can you expect during volcanic unrest or during an eruption? Um, well, from these presentations, I hope you can understand that you can expect that a lot of dedicated scientists, your community planners, and first responders are going to be working together to understand what's going on and share the necessary information with you, which is why it's important to know how to get those alerts. Um, but they're all going to be doing whatever they can to lessen the impacts of this huge event. So you're not alone. Um, a mountain erupting seems like it's huge, but it's something that with preparedness you can work on. Um, so every step you take to be more prepared will help them help you. Um, so with that, I would like to um, start addressing some of your questions and I will quickly facilitate this, but I'm leaving some links up there on the screen for you as well. And take my video off. OK. So thank you everyone who's sent in questions so far. Um, I've seen that some have been answered in here um, because we've gone over time. We won't try to go too long, but um, some of these are. Um, yes, I hope that some of the published answers are in there and have started answering questions, but um, some good ones we wanted to discuss. Um, after Mount St. Helens erupted, they found a lot of the rock inside the mountains was hydrothermally altered. Is that an issue with Mount Rainier weakening the rock? Um, it looks like Liz and John both answered that question, but would either of you like to talk about that a little bit more? Uh, sure, this is John. Um, yeah, uh, prior studies have shown that there are a few areas uh, high on the flank of Mount Rainier that uh, do contain some hydrothermally altered rock. Um, the largest concentration of that material uh, appears to be over kind of in the western side, the upper Sunset Amphitheater, upper Headwall of Tone Creek. Um, and so uh, one of the things, uh, because Mount Rainier has a, a history of shedding large lahars, one possible way of generating a lahar would be to have a large landslide of weak material. And so one of the reasons um, the, the simulation uh, that that report uh, that we released discusses and focuses on Puyallup and Nisqually Valleys is because that particular report looks at what would happen if uh, landslides of different sizes, large landslides of different sizes occurred on the western side in the Sunset Amphitheater or, or in the Tahoma Creek headwall. Um, and so that's what those simulations are meant to show. Hypothetically, if you had a large uh, landslide of, of this hydrothermally altered rock material and it turned into a lahar, you know, how fast would that lahar move down the valley? Where would it go? How big would it be? 
And that's also one of the reasons why we are um, focusing right now on building out a, a Lahar detection system over uh, in those valleys on the west side. Um, the the other flanks of Mount Rainier, the rock is much stronger. It does not appear to be hi as hydrothermally altered. Um, and so in the other valleys, uh, most likely Lahars and those other valleys would be triggered by an eruption of the volcano that melted the snow and ice. And so if Mount Rainier became restless, that would be the event that should put Lahars on people's radar. Um, so we would know that should Rainier erupt, uh, Lahars are likely in other valleys. Uh, but it's over, over on this western side in the upper Puyallup uh, in upper Nisqually where there is some hydrothermally altered rock. Um, that's an area where potentially you could get a large landslide not associated with an eruption that could trigger a lahar. And so that's why uh, we did the simulations there um, showing what potentially could happen and why we're focusing our lahar detection system over in those valleys right now. Thank you, John. Um, we have a question about um, evacuation for Lahar, um, mentioning traffic uh, from Kelly. We know we mentioned walking, but driving may be the only option for some folks who are disabled or have small children, um, which is a really good question. Um, Kirsten, would you like to say anything about how that was addressed in your drill or what the what the thoughts are at the EPIC level? Yeah, thank you, Brian, and um, thank you for asking that question. Um, it's uh, it's a focus of the coalition and in our individual in individual jurisdictions when we're doing emergency planning uh, to work with um, access and functional need planners and resources um, because we recognize that there are uh, folks who will need um, to do some specialized planning based on uh, based on their needs and resources in the event of an emergency. So you saw that one picture in the presentation where uh, there was a student who was in uh, who was in a wheelchair, um, really ensuring that we uh, work with um, schools and anyone that they've identified um, that needs any other uh, in any other planning or any other resource. Um, and we're very fortunate to have some really great uh, some really great partners and stakeholders from access and functional needs planning. Um, who who work with us from the very beginning. Um, and that I think is something to uh, really um, remind emergency managers about and community members who are involved in, in emergency planning that you need to involve stakeholders from your entire community from the beginning so that you're planning uh, with people, not necessarily for people. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. See, we got a couple new. Um, okay, they've been published. Yeah, and I can see that some folks in the chat are also, or in the Q and A, are also sharing their own tips um, as far as like having room for um, drinking water and places to store food. Let's see if there's any other good. Um, I'll do one more question for. Um, well, I guess we had this question about um, messaging for Lahar risk, um, but are there plans for um, air quality preparedness specific to that? Um, this was answered in the chat, but it might be good to address um, out loud as well. Um, so what kind of preparedness is being done or what are the air quality issues associated with Washington volcanoes? Sure, I, I think the question uh, originally was about Mount Rainier and uh, the, the focus of uh, Mount Rainier, the real focus is on Lahars. I mean, Mount Rainier has a history of shedding large Lahars. Mount Rainier is not a particularly explosive volcano. It it does it has had some explosive eruptions, but not nearly like Mount St. Helens. Uh, so at Mount Rainier, the big hazard really is Lahars. Uh, it's also produced some lava flows. Uh, but if Mount Rainier was to become restless, uh, one of the things we do at the Cascades Volcano Observatory is we would run uh, daily uh, ashfall prediction models. And those would be based on the, the wind directions uh, at a particular time on that particular day and you know, with some hypothetical eruption plume size. And it would show uh, where the ash would, would likely be carried and um, how much of that ash would actually be deposited. And so th those, you know, the, the air quality is really going to be affected by um, the volcanic ash, any volcanic ash that's in the air. And so, uh, you know, like I said, we, 
um, for, for any of our volcanoes, if any of them became restless, we would run daily uh, hypothetical ashfall uh, simulations. And then um, I'd really encourage folks to take a look. I, I, I can't, I, I don't know what the, uh, the URL link is right off the top of my head, but uh, at our USGS uh, Volcanoes websites, we do have uh, information on volcanic ashfall and we talk about how to mitigate and, and some of the health hazards. So I, I would encourage people to take a look at those. Thank you, John. All right, and to be respectful of everyone's time, this has gone a bit over, but um, appreciate everyone's questions. A huge thank you to John Major, Liz Westby, and Kirsten Hoffman, our presenters, and um, hope that everybody was able to learn something from today about how to get prepared for our volcanoes. So thank you all so much for joining, and uh, we take care, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Take care, all. Thanks for participating. Okay. Bye.